the second part of uh, well, uh, the, the syntax we are dealing with here. Um, <coughs> one of the things you can do is control uh, which, um, which argument to a subroutine is actually passed as the object. So what we have here is this keyword pass value. Um, and that would become um, the, the object uh, that is passed rather than just the first one. Um, you can see that over here. So now the first argument is, uh, is a logical unit number and the second is the object you want to, uh, to pass. Um, it may seem uh, a bit, bit odd to do something like that, uh, but actually you can use this to uh, adjust existing code to, um, to, this, um, to this paradigm. Because if you have uh, old code or existing code, which uses um, um, a kind of sequence like this, so where the, the object you may want to, uh, to use is uh, somewhere in the, in the argument list, but not necessarily the first one, you can actually um, uh, do that by uh, passing, uh, by, by, ex by specifying this pass attribute rather than rewriting this, um, uh, this interface with the consequence that everywhere you use this original um, uh, subroutine, you would have to um, adjust all these, uh, these, uh, these interfaces, all these calls. So that's one thing. Another thing, all right, uh, well, this is how you would in invoke it. So it doesn't look different than before, but only this, this um, object is passed as a second argument rather than the first. An alternative would be to directly uh, call the right um, new my type, my new type uh, routine. And then of course um, you get all the arguments in the, in the order in which it is uh, defined in the, um, in the declaration and implementation of that uh, routine. Um, you can also choose not to pass it as implicitly. So um, we saw that uh, um, before. Um, if you do that uh, with a no pass uh, argument, uh, attributes, um, you would have to specify the object yourself. And one particular use you could make of that is uh, if uh, this routine works on the class rather than on the individual objects. It would be in, in a way to, um, <coughs> uh, to, signify, to signal that the routine uh, works on, on something different than just that particular uh, object. It's a matter of choice, a matter of uh, style, I think, uh, whether you do something like this, but it can be useful. Um, we've seen them already, abstract classes and deferred procedures. Well, types can be abstract and uh, procedures can be deferred. Um, and that indicates that uh, the, the class as such is not meant to be used um, directly but you have to uh, impl uh, implement um, various things. Um, these procedures, for instance, what you get is um, the promise that if you uh, make a, a class uh, that extends this type, this one, this ab abstract type, then you promise that uh, you'll fill in um, the requirements for um, a method called calc, with the template, with the interface defined by this calculate template. That's done, um, it's deferred. So there's no default implementation for that method. You have to specify it yourself. Um, and by extending the, the abstract type uh, like this, uh, very much in the way we did it before, you now specify that this procedure has this particular um, interface and for this particular type uh, you get uh, calc my data as a concrete um, uh, implementation of it. Uh, these deferred um, methods are defined uh, by abstract interfaces. 
So here we go. We have an abstract interface. It works um, very much like an or ordinary interface, um, but it defines what the procedure uh, should look like and what procedure pointers uh, should look like. And uh, we'll come to that later. So abstract interfaces are applicable to ordinary types also. You don't have to have these um, um, these deferred uh, um, methods. Um, it's it's uh, it gives you quite some some choices for implementation, but by using uh, abstract types and abstract interfaces, you indicate that certain things have to be implemented, and that you can't rely on the default implementation. Um, in ordinary types. Uh, and ordinary classes, you would have to implement everything. And with these abstract uh, types and abstract interfaces, you can uh, um, define, in fact, a sort of contract. And anyone who wants to use that, um, that abstract interface or abstract type has to fill in the gaps. Um, so um, that gives you um, a way to, to um, to make sure that things are done for that particular extended type rather than that people um, forget about that and use something which is, uh, um, which is default but doesn't necessarily mean anything for that, uh, for that type. Um, procedure pointers, um, also a very useful thing. Um, they are um, in fact pointers to functions and subroutines and you can use these abstract interfaces to define what um, the procedure pointer can do. Um, let's have a look. Um, these pointers, um, they point to a particular routine like this. And this will only go if that particular routine has the right uh, interface. And now you can call this routine either via the pointer or directly via this. And the fun thing here, um, or at least I think it's, it's very funny, uh, very nice, is that um, it doesn't matter whether uh, you call it via the, function, via the function pointer or via the name it directly. There's no, um, no syntactical difference. Um, and that means, for instance, that if you use this in your, um, in your class, you can get objects that do one thing and other objects that do another thing, depending on how these pointers are set. Uh, let me see. So um, this illustrates that. Um, it contains, oh, I see, I, I made a mistake here. Um, this should be over here uh, because these pointers are regarded as um, simple components rather than as methods. Um, so in the code below, I define an array of, um, of uh, variable, an array of type my data. It's uh, 10 long. I initialize um, the, the, the pointer to uh, do calculation one and only for, um, for number two. Uh, element number two, I do another calculation. So if I iterate over this uh, over this array and let every every um, uh, element do its job, then for every element uh, we will use um, calculation number one, except for number two, which do, uses this uh, particular calculation. So that could be um, a way to um, to have a lot of uh, objects that do their own stuff without you having to, uh, uh, to special case all this. Um, something which can also be very, um, very useful is that if an object um, um, ceases to exist, you may want to clean up things. Um, for instance, close a file which is, uh, um, which is connected to that object. Um, or release memory that you have um, um, allocated. 
and uh, would uh, lose access to. Um, if an object is local to a routine or it is explicitly deallocated, then the finalizer will be used and will be invoked. Um, here's an example of how that works. Um, it is a method, um, and in this case is called final. So that um, indicates for the compiler that it is a routine which should be used uh, when the uh, object ceases to exist. And um, it gets only one, uh, one argument, the object, and you do anything which is necessary to, um, um, to, um, to clean up things. You could also use it to write to a, a log file that this has happened. So you can um, um, record uh, where an object was, uh, was deallocated and um, see whether that um, conforms to your expectations of the program. Um, the thing we saw before, um, I'm going to explain that a bit more. Um, like we have with um, interfaces, that uh, you uh, define a particular name to uh, point to, to, uh, to alias um, a number of other routines. And depending on the, on the signature, um, the right one is, is chosen based on all, your, uh, on all your arguments. That can also be done with the methods. And for that, we define these uh, generic type bound procedures. Um, it works more or less in the same way as uh, with uh, ordinary um, generic names, but the syntax is slightly different. And uh, what you see is here. You have these procedures. Um, they have unique names and it points, oh, uh, this should be a, uh, uh, an error, of course, but they point to um, specific routines. Um, I see I do, do more um, mistakes here. Uh, the generic um, keyword then gets you this name and you list which, um, um, which methods actually uh, are useful here. And um, these subroutines uh, are then uh, part of, of um, are then part of the, 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 the class and you get um, you can call these these methods by just this uh, generic name. Um, you can also um, overwrite, um, make sure that these um, type bound procedures are not overwritten by um, a new uh, derived, by new extended type. Um, that's done with a non overwritable uh, um, keywords. And that means that in any, um, any class you, you extend from this one, it always gets this particular um, version of that routine. Um, that, that's, it will depend on the, the, the thing, um, on the, how do you call it? Um, on the particular problem you are trying to solve, whether this is useful or not but know that this is uh, uh, certainly a possibility. Um, then what may also be um, of interest to you is how this all dif differs from um, the facilities in C++. As uh, Tiziano already explained, um, Fortran doesn't have uh, the C++ style uh, constructed routines. Um, it does define uh, finalizers and they can be very useful uh, because that takes away a lot of uh, the, uh, the the maintenance you would otherwise have to do um, and perhaps uh, an important well important um, difference is that um, Fortran doesn't allow multiple inheritance what you can do is extend the interfaces to the to the various routines, um, and what you also can do is the technique of aggregation, which means that you uh, 
combine uh, two or more objects in, an, in a larger object rather than tr try and put everything in one interface to one type of class. But um, multiple inheritance like with C++ is not possible. Um, the other thing that um, I try to, to, uh, to show you, um, there's no difference in calling routines via pointers or via uh, fixed names. That means that um, actually for the, uh, for the user, um, this is completely transparent. And so if you change that in your, uh, in your, class, um, in your class definition, then um, the code for the, for the user only has to be um, recompiled and not um, changed to go from a, a percent to some other kind of uh, uh, operator like you would have in uh, C++. Um, so this um, concludes um, the uh, what I had to I would like to tell you about uh, the syntax of uh, object-oriented programming in Fortran. So let's have a, let's go at the various uh, um, uh, exercises. Um, the ones. Uh, Tiziano um, described, and there's a, a few more in uh, in the um, in the set of exercises that I uh, uh, wrote. Um, I see a number of uh, questions on the on the chat. Let me see. Procedure components. Um, the procedure components, those are, yes, there's a question uh, to uh, Norman um, to give an example. Well, if you have an example already, then we can uh, have a look at that. Otherwise, um, I'm going to look at the other questions. Um, For the class, for the abstract class, you must define a first arguments class where for um, there's a type. Well, let me check that I have that right because um, it's easy to make a mistake. No, it's indeed a, um, a type we have to specify. And I think that um, the type, the, the finalizers are uh, called um, in order. So if you have a class uh, which um, extends another class, which also has a finalizer, and first the um, most extended um, class is uh, finalized and then another one is uh, is finalized um, or the other way around I'm not quite sure about that but um, I seem to remember that there's a sort of certain um, sequence of finalizers being used so that's probably the reason why you have a, have to use a type rather than a class Um, can you call finalizers explicitly? Um, yes, certainly, because they uh, act as uh, 
um, ordinary subroutines. What in the case where I, that's from Nicolas Koenig. Um, what in the case where I don't know the run type of the object, if it has been handled in, handled in as a, as a superclass, for instance. Hmm. Could you provide Yeah, this sort of things is, uh, uh, we're getting into the nitty gritty details of, uh, um, of what's happening with these uh, objects. Um, I guess the, the quickest way to, do, to deal with that is write a small program which illustrates what's happening. Um, and certainly the order in which um, our, um, finalized are used, invoked, that could be, um, um, a nice subject for such a uh, such a small project pro, uh, program. And yes, um, like I said, um, Fortran doesn't have uh, multiple inheritance, um, and I must uh, uh, quite agree with uh, Thomas Koenig about that. Um, Multiple inheritance in C++ seems to uh, be uh, another cause of much confusion and also uh, much um, much errors because you could inherit that's the fi the famous diamond um, shaped inheritance um, you could inherit uh, from the same class via um, via two subclasses um, and then it's uh, completely uh, unclear um, what the various um, methods and um, attributes uh, um, originate from. Um, my drawing skills are very limited so um, let me try something here. To illustrate that, using uh, Fortran terms rather than inheritance. So that's the, 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 the diamond shaped inheritance problem. Well, since we don't have that in Fortran, um, we don't have to deal with this sort of, uh, um, this sort of things. Let's see, we have, Another one. Right. Um, Alin has uh, has. Uh, um, I suppose this, this, co this code, 
where you see a select case with a lot of a um, lot of cases in between. And indeed, all these sort of things you could uh, store inside um, the, the procedure pointer. Because um, one uh, value of the procedure pointer could be a routine that does this, another one that does this, etc. So do we have any more questions? So um, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, Tiziano, um, the question by Aline is, uh, is quite suitable for <laughs> is quite suitable for um, for your uh, command uh, pattern. Let me check. Um. It con uh, con uh, concerns micro MD. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's that's exactly what I meant. Yes. That's yeah. That's it. You have you have an operation, and you also have parameters, and you don't want. The, the place where you call the procedure to, to know about the parameters. And that's where you use a function object. Because then you have the function to be called and the parameter bundled in one object. A help question. I'm all, always worried when, when, when they come from compiler people. <laughs> it's, it's always kind of like seems seems like a tricky one. <laughs> I'll mute my uh, my uh, microphone. Um, just a question, are in, 
that was your last presentation. Yeah, sure. That was my last presentation. So the thing that's left is uh, uh, the exercises and uh, questions, discussions. Yes. And uh, Thomas's uh, question in the help. Well, I have to look into it. Uh, I doubt I can help. <laughs> um, but but uh, well, sure, uh, there's an answer. So let's keep the Zoom open um, to see whether we have any discussion we, we could do here until uh, seven. And, uh, and uh, yeah, work on the issues. And if someone wants to ask directly or discuss directly, just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. There's a question in the chat about the transfer function and it's and using it with derived types, which is something that I'm I haven't played much with, so I'd be interested to hear if anybody knows much about that. I've never thought of uh, doing that. Um, the things I've done with the transfer are mainly getting uh, um, data in the right shape, but I've never used it on, on the right types, I think. So um, integers and, uh, and reals and that sort of thing. My understanding is that the transfer function is basically a type unsafe way of just taking raw memory and copying it from one place to another. So you kind of have to have to be very careful with it, I would think. Um, it has a bad reputation, that's certain. And of course, derived types could have uh, padding, um, padding bytes inside, and I don't know what's happening with them. Um, maybe also the other question warrants some discussion. Um, so on finalizers and about making them elemental, and I think the reason, so maybe as a background, the, the, the problem we have there, I think, is that when you want to free or deallocate um, an array of user-defined types where you have a finalizer on. And to be honest, I've, I've worked with that. I, I tried to do something like a nested tree and I didn't find a compatible way which would work with at least three compilers. So the best I could get is a memory leak. And the worst is an ice or kind of like incompliant parsing um, from, from different compilers. So that might be, so I think you have, if, so I think it's a bad thing that you have to worry when you write a finalize that you have to worry whether your type is used in an array or not. I think that's, that's really unintuitive. Yes. This could also um, indicate uh, uh, limitations in the compiler, of course. Um, I wouldn't think it's, it's uh, inherent to the language. There, there's actually been an interp proposed and voted on, almost full done voting on with regards to finalizers and the, the current writing in the standard in some ways allows a finalizer to be called more than once. But so there, so there, that's what the interp is about is, is some of the compilers ended up calling a, a finalizer more than once. And so there's a, the interp is trying to fix that so so that you kind of guarantee that that a finalizer won't be called more than once for a given object but there there's some there's some interesting stuff going on with like if i if i extend from a derived type that has a finalizer then the finalizer for the extended type needs to call the finalizer for the base type and so if if you have multiple components with 
it, it gets it gets interesting in how that and how all that gets worked out and what order do the finalizers get called and, and and ensuring that they don't get called more than once and deallocation is not the same as finalization although deallocating something is supposed to call the finalizer right so so they are not the same and they interact in interesting ways and so there's there's some discussion about how the language is actually defined in terms of all that stuff so it's still kind of a work in progress at this point i think okay uh, i think that the double free is is what i ran into in, in one variation of my of my test code um but but still it's i would i would like to see that finalizers have to be by default elemental because having freeing one object is basically the special case of freeing an array of objects right so that's that's something i don't see why i as a as a class or class writer have to care about whether my class is used in an array or not yeah, I would, I would suspect that if you're trying to do something where you need a finalizer that's not elemental, that may be the wrong design. Right, if, I, if I've got an array of something that, that, I've only, that I'm trying to share a resource with, that would be the instance where you're, you wouldn't want it to be elemental. So you could, you know, in a thread safe right. way. That, that might be if you um, have... Um... Uh, drive um, yeah, an array of drive types where um, there's a pointer to some some memory, and of course you then you don't know um, which which one comes first and which one should then um, uh, deallocate that that uh, that memory. Well, but you also get the the finalizer is called on a temporary right, on a single temporary. Yes. So there, there you go with the non-elemental. So yeah, this is... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> well, talking about that, uh, um, it, it should be obvious what, what's happening or what should happen. Um, but I can imagine that there's a lot of uh, complications underneath, like uh, Brett is uh, indicating. Hmm. I think I'm learning a lot. <laughs> I think part of the problem is that if you have a derived type that has several components, and each of those components are a type that has a finalizer, then the order in which the components get finalized is is hard to predict. <clears throat> yes, and it will probably uh, depend on uh, the compiler you're using or, or on uh, on options uh, for the for the compile step. Right. Um, but if that matters, then um, your objects would be or the components would be. Um, interdependent. So that would be a bad design if that happens, I think. Yeah, if, if you're in a situation where it matters the order of finalization, the, then you're kind of in a situation where you're sharing some resource with not without a real indication of who owns that resource. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, trying to manage how, how do you release it is a really thorny problem. 